podcast where we talk to smart people, but not necessarily done by smart people. That is an awesome question. This one goes down probably on one of my top five. Hey, I like nutrition. I like to eat food. This is the coolest thing ever. We're going to do this forever. I wish I paid more attention in that class. You know, I'm going to be honest. I don't understand that. <laughs> As a man, I just, I don't get it. Welcome to welcome smartpeoplepodcast.com. To smartpeoplepodcast.com. Hello and welcome to Smart People Podcast, conversations that satisfy your curious mind. Chris Stampier, thanks for joining me. How's your summer going? Hopefully it's going pretty well. Maybe you're getting down to the beach, having some fun, listening to some podcasts, obviously. Or you're in a cube. Either way, thanks for tuning in. We've got a great episode for you today. We're going to be talking about something that it touches everyone, but some of us understand it better than others, and I'm not on the side that understands it. Today, we're talking about disruptive technologies. If that sounds awesome to you, great. Tune in. You'll love it. If it sounds boring, before you turn it off, I just want to throw some thoughts at you. So first of all, how much do you know about blockchain, which is like Bitcoin, right? That money that's going to revolutionize the world. How about AI? What about the sharing economy? Here's the thing. Many of these, including AI and blockchain, are kind of in its infancy. Some are a little bit older with the sharing economy. But even just a few years ago, many of these were not in the public lexicon. You'd probably never heard about them. And these are just a few of the technologies that are going to completely disrupt how we live and how we work. And it's important to know this because... What about your industry? What about the business you run, the job you do, the education your child is getting? Is it going to be here? Is it going to be relevant? Well, look, no one has that answer. But what we do have is a system or a methodology that we can use to understand, evaluate, and respond to disruptive technologies. And we have that system because of our guest this week. So this week, we are speaking with Paul Armstrong. And Paul is a leading strategist, author, and speaker on the future of technology. Paul runs the technology advisory Hereforth, where he helps clients understand trends and how to sensibly apply emerging technologies strategically. His first book is titled Disruptive Technologies, Understand, Evaluate, Respond. And this book offers organizations and individuals a distinct response to emerging technologies. So it's a way for all of us to understand when we hear of something, when we see something in our business, when we're being challenged by a new technology, how do we get our arms around it? And then what do we do about it? So tech novices and enthusiasts alike, tune in and see how disruptive technologies can impact the world, your life, your job, and what you can do about it. As always, let us know what you think. We are at smartpeoplepodcast at gmail.com. Actually, email John. Let him know. He loves technology. He'll probably nerd out with you about this stuff. So I'll just forward them all to him. And do us a favor. Tell a friend. You like the show? If they like technology, let them know. We really appreciate it. All right. We're going to turn it over to Paul Armstrong as we discuss a whole number of things, including his new book, Disruptive Technologies. Enjoy. Well, Paul, first, I want to say thanks so much for uh, coming across the pond in technologically speaking, right? And uh, doing this Skype podcast with us. No problem. Thanks so much for having me. You deal in this space of technology, disruptive technologies, emerging technologies. And I always wonder when I talk to anyone who's interested in these things, considering I have never had a supreme interest, were you always interested in it? Did you consider yourself a tech nerd growing up? No, I was actually far from it. I remember dad and mum used to be very sort of uh, forward thinking when it came to technology and we'd always have a, like, a computer in the lounge and everything like that. Uh, and I did computing at what you would call high school, but um, not really a nerd, didn't really code, not really interested in all of that sort of thing. But the one thing I was really interested in was asking why a lot. And I've been told by my mother several times that I asked why an awful lot as a child. And so she wasn't surprised when I sort of went into psychology at both um, high school and then on through uh, the degree. So I think 
while I'm fascinated with technology, I'm much more fascinated with people and how they use it. And I think that's a sort of key difference for a lot of people out there doing similar work. Often they focus on the technology and what it can do and that sort of stuff. And they forget the human elements that all, is always required with technology. Uh, and so, yeah, for me, it was always about asking why and figuring out why things are happening in a certain way or why people do what they do. And that, that for me, was the real driver for like why I got into technology. So you were uh, into psychology first. Mm. That's interesting. For some reason, I, I was just really more fascinated. And I thought to me, I didn't really know what I wanted to do when I um, first had to pick uh, what you want to do for the rest of your life at a sure. very early age. But I did think to myself, look, if I know how people tick, I'm in a better position than most people because they won't have that information. And, you know, they'll either learn math and that sort of thing. And I can learn that extra stuff mm -hmm. if I need to. But what really made sense to me at that time was figuring out people because those are the ones that you're either going to be working with or working for and that sort of thing so understanding how people tick made made it more sense to me than going in straight doing like french or something like that really interesting but i don't consider that a, a basis for what you should really know mm. if you're you know in a world of eight billion humans it just for some reason it just made more sense to me to go into psychology sure well that's fascinating because we cover a lot of psychology and that industry and that uh, area on the podcast but you don't typically see too many people who kind of bridge that gap between the very human side and then technology, which, as you kind of mentioned, I believe to be the very non-human side. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I'm not, I don't know, I'm not very engaged in it because it seems cold and hard to me. And I think what you're saying is not really the case. No, I, I mean, when you think about it, technology in its purest form was always made to make our lives easier in some way, whether that was um, a plow and a field or a chatbot. You know, it, it can really uh, be seen from all spectrums. But what I do see is both ends coming together and meeting in the middle more and more, especially with social media and social platforms. You start to really sort of see a hybrid start to happen between the two. Now, you can still take it from a spectrum going way towards the other end, which is something I've been speaking about recently to a lot of people, which is biohacking and trans humanism where you've got technology either implanted in the body or people are putting things inside themselves which will augment their experience whether that's magnets or things like that so really fascinating topic but you can also take it right back down to the end where people are just using tablets to learn new skills and that sort of stuff you know and augment their brain in that sort of way i find technology and people's use of it absolutely fascinating but technology for technology's sake will never give you the full picture i don't think that's a great point and you have this business, uh, which is called Hereforth, and I want to talk about that. But what now what I'm interested in is how did you get, how did you bridge that gap from psychology to technology, especially given, I mean, you do a lot of work with large corporations. They bring you in and they need help on these emerging technologies. There's a lot to learn there. And so if it wasn't something you grew up doing or you studied in college, how did you get up to speed to the point where you're seen as an expert in this field? Sure. I, I had a really weird career when I first started. So I did my psychology degree up at Lincoln University, which is like halfway up the country up, um, over here, and um, literally went to work in a pub um, afterwards and was sort of figuring out the next move. And my friend um, said, hey, I'm over in Los Angeles. I've got a floor. Do you want to um, kip on it for like three months and just uh, come out and see what like, LA is about? I think you'd really get a kick out of it. Uh, and I said, free holiday? That sounds great. And mm -hmm. I went over there, got the visa. And I thought to myself, while I'm over there, let's do this bit of smart, you know, bit of something smart and um, do an internship while I was over there. So I joined a company called Michael Levine, um, which at the time, which was LCO, Levine Communications Office, uh, which helped local businesses and celebrities like Michael Jackson, Barbara Streisand and those sorts of people through those periods using finger wheels, uh, parts of their career. Um, and I got to work on Louise's Trattoria and loads of other weird and wonderful um, outlets that were there you know, um, minor celebrities all the way through to um, celebrity voice coaches, real raft of things. But I was thrown in at the deep end, given a lot of trust and was helping people with their careers and that sort of stuff. And I, I, I thought it was great and that sort of thing. And we started going more and more into digital influencers and that sort of stuff. And so that's where I really started to use what I'd been learning at university through psychology and comms to really bring out um, 
that sort of element and the, I saw the power that it had to move people to either go to a place to get people to think a different way and that sort of stuff and so that's that's really where I sort of got the bug for the internet and technology and then um, a year and a half went on and I went to a PR week event uh, at the time and I was chatting to a guy at a bar about a co- um, campaign we just run to get bloggers to go into a restaurant and um, review it and it was uh, at that time it was mind-blowing these days it'd be like the lowest common denominator thing that you could do um, but a guy had overheard that conversation and said, do you want to come in for an informational interview? Saying that to a British person doesn't mean anything because we don't have those over here. <laughs> um, but at the time, I, I said, sure, give me the card and that sort of stuff. And I Googled him afterwards, and it was Dean Bender from a company, Dean uh, Bender Helper Impact, which works with um, all of the major um, movie studios in Hollywood, um, including digital companies like Yahoo and other places like that. So it was a really big offer that I was given um, and again worked in uh, media relations and working with hardcore digital outreach and that sort of stuff um, and it was just an amazing opportunity that I was given with work with um, one of the first digital music subscription offerings which was Yahoo Music Unlimited at the time didn't work with Apple so you can understand why that probably didn't work <laughs> um, but we also did a lot of um, outreach to digital platforms um, you know burgeoning MySpace and that sort of stuff snap forward to about two years in and my co-worker debbie peters went to work in-house at paramount and they had a policy of taking any aliens of which i was still you know called one because i'm not from the country <sighs> and um so we were we were a crack unit but uh, we parted ways i stayed um at bender helper and um, rejigged the team ever so slightly um but i got a call from Rhonda brower of um burson marstella fame um, which is a massive um corporate comms um hardcore comms company um that had seen some of the work we'd done for um yahoo and she offered me a job working on sony and activision and she said what you've done for them i want you to do 10 times harder for these guys um and she was a great a great boss learned a lot from her and um yeah so i went and worked for them uh if you don't know uh, Burson Marstella. If you've ever seen an episode of CSI Miami, you know exactly where I worked because that's where they filmed it. It was mm. bizarre. Um, it, uh, it really ranged. We launched Sony Alpha cameras. We were working with technology platforms. We were doing deals with uh, major media, minor media, all of that sort of stuff. It was really, really um, a great uh, time. And then out of the blue, I got a call from Jeff Berman who said, come in, we need to chat to you. And at the time we were doing a big call of duty buy, um, which made us, uh, I went in and I was explaining to Jeff, uh, we're really excited. We can't wait for it to go live. We're really um, pumped about the game and that sort of stuff. And um, he just kept asking me questions about myself, which I thought was a bit weird. And then I obviously twigged, he was interviewing me for a role. Mm. And um, I was very lucky to be offered a role to go and work at a company called MySpace at that time. I was given 24 hours and I had to um, give him an answer. And I got to meet Chris and Tom and Danny and and um, we, I joined the team there. And um, about two years later, uh, after Rupert Murdoch had bought them and lots of things had changed, I was doing a role that um, sort of was about MySpace video at the time, which was obviously number two to YouTube. We were chasing them. Um, and then really uh, focused on a couple of bits, whether a bit to do with child protection, um, lots of other various sort of hats that you need to wear when you're working in that sort of environment. It was a great job and I worked with some incredibly smart people. Um, obviously, you know, history is unfolded and that sort of stuff. Um, but, yeah, that, that's when I decided uh, – I was writing those sorts of bits about uh, traffic and uh, users and that sort of stuff for investors and analysts and that sort of stuff. And it uh, it made sense for me to jump back to the UK. So that's when I jumped back. And um, yeah, I, I started work at a company called Kindred, did a lot of government work with them. And then I joined Mindshare, which is a global media buying firm. And we got to work with uh, directly with platforms like Twitter, Facebook, all of those sorts of people. And we ran a team of about 20 um, for brands like Ford, HSBC, um, Unilever, Nestle, those sorts of things, working on really massive campaigns. Um, and we did some amazing work to really integrate social into um the banking platform and that sort of stuff. And I've always said, if you can do anything for a bank, you can do it for anyone because it's obviously mm. one of the most highly regulated areas and they have lots of checks and balances, procurement and everything. And so, yeah, so that's where my career sort of led me and everything was going fine with um, mind, uh, Mindshare, loving a lot. 
Uh, but it was just time for me to try something new. Um, and so that's when I dreamed up here forth and I decided to take the plunge and work for myself. Um, and so I started drumming up business uh, after I'd left Mindshare and I'm still doing it today. And that's what, four, five, five years on. Wow. Well, I appreciate that background. One question I had. So you, you go through all these companies and, and you're doing different things. I still couldn't put my finger on what you were actually doing at those companies. So you went through it quickly, but is it, was that mostly media? Were you doing advertising? I couldn't, I was trying to figure out, I mean, I get the intersection of technology and social and all of that, yep. um, but trying to kind of see the progression. Yeah. So I first started out being for literally all intents and purposes, a talent publicist. I'd work with um, minor celebrities and that sort of stuff or small businesses who are looking to make it big and, or had some sort of um, PR value to them and that sort of stuff. Then as the career progressed, we started getting much more focused into digital outreach and digital strategy and that sort of thing, making real changes to either their bottom line through online sales or through um, offline sales and driving massive campaigns like that then you get to people like yahoo where again you're working in the media and you're doing you're overseeing deals and like hardcore strategy of how to roll out new projects how to make sure that they're seen in the right light and making mm. sure that you're timing them right and then myspace was very much an internal um uh, role but obviously with external uh, feelers which went out to the media and that sort of stuff so yeah definitely pr com i sort of it sort of went talent pr uh internal comms uh in-house and then um more of the startup uh world and that sort of stuff uh, I when i got back to the uk so yeah i've, I've had a, a varied career <laughs> yeah and so before here for it, the last thing well not the last thing but uh when you were in the states it was myspace and yeah. I mean, OK, so MySpace, an interesting story that you could spend an entire episode on. But how did you just somebody just why, why were they interviewing you for it? You must have and through some humility, I'm assuming, but you must have left some parts out I, or were they just not that large at the time and you just kind of fell into it? I mean, what what was how did you get drafted essentially to come work for them? <laughs> It felt like being drafted as well. Yeah. Um, it was a good way of putting it. Uh, I believe I was, well, I was headhunted for the role. I was asked to go in and uh, interview and that sort of stuff. So, but I think uh, Jeff had seen a lot of the stuff that we were doing for Activision and the way I'd handled myself in meetings and the strategies that we were putting across. And I believe that's why I was asked in. So, mm. I don't think there was any secret sauce or anything specifically I could give anyone's advice on. I think I was just in a good position. I'd built up uh, a good network while I was out there, and there was a couple of pieces that were hitting in the media, like profiles on me, but nothing, obviously, you know, fortune, sure. cover of fortune or anything like that. Um, but yeah, no, we were, we were doing great work. I, I'm not ashamed to say that. We were doing some great work out there that was getting noticed, and I think that's why I got picked to go in. And the things that were getting noticed was, was it essentially the, the eyeballs, the users, the, the buzz, the everything you could do to launch these initiatives, whatever they may be? Is that what you were kind of um, getting noticed for? Was that the great work that was being done? Yeah, I think it was that. I think it was a bit of um, strategic sort of insights that we were giving out to different things if you were speaking on panels and that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, ultimately, I think people, you know, there, there's only so much of a talent pool in LA that you want to go out to and when you're at the right level and seeing that the right things and saying the right stuff you know word word does get around it's not a huge community out there I think it's getting bigger and obviously the startup community helping mm -hmm. but um, at that time when we were out there there were very few people that could actually talk the talk and walk the walk when it came to digital um, there, were very, there were a lot of people and I still think that's true today a lot of people that talk about it but very few people that talk and do mm -hmm. um, and that's a big a big difference when it comes to you know who you want to hire and who you want to work with and this might seem basic but it's really interesting to ask these basic questions when you refer to a lot of people who you know don't necessarily walk the talk when it comes to digital are you talking specifically social or what does that mean exactly? I, I, I don't definitely mean so. Social is a really big um, industry now, obviously. And I definitely think um, there are people who um, 
I'm trying to be delicate here, who <laughs> talk a good game, but actually if you put them in front of a client that was asking them hard questions and asked them to really deliver, would struggle. Um, I think there are people in the industry who have come up through the grassroots, who have you know done the time, as they say, and work through you know hardships and that sort of stuff, um, know how the systems work, um, and can give a really good strategy and be honest and say, you know what, if you want to do that, this is what it's going to take. There are other people who haven't had those experiences, but have read about them or you know seen a talk and that sort of stuff and just haven't had those experiences but you know still profess to do that or claim to be able to do that and uh, it's not helping the industry if that makes sense but yeah. yeah that's from a social perspective but there's lots of people out there you know if i was talking about emerging tech there are people who haven't read clay christensen's innovators dilemma book you know mm -hmm. but claim to talk about disruption all the time and you go you can't really talk about that unless you know that guy because he's the godfather of it you know mm -hmm. so it's one thing to sort of be passionate about it and be enthusiastic and it's another to go out there and be a cheerleader for it and that sort of stuff. It's about knowing exactly what you want to get across, how to do it, but also being able to deliver the work if a client needs it. Unless you're just going to be a speaking head for the rest of your life, which is totally doable as well. But personally, I have to talk to clients. So it's one thing for me to know about it and wax lyrical on it. Right. But it's a very much another for me to say, yeah, I'm happy doing that for you. That's, yeah. that's what I have to feel confident doing, if that makes sense. No, that does. That makes a lot of sense. So let's talk about this. So you start your own firm, you get some clients and what are they asking you to do? Sure. So I started my business um, and I'd broken my back in December. So I was very lucky to have a very understanding client called Camelot, which is like um, the National Lottery over there. Um, and I worked with them for about a year through um, recovery. So I was very, very blessed to have them as uh, my first client. Um, they asked me to look over their digital strategy and their um, offline execution. We were looking at um, different parts of the strategy, whether that was POS, point of sale, uh, elements and like all through the customer journey. So it was a big overarching campaign to be like, how can we just be better? That was our like overall mm -hmm. game of like, how can we be better on social? How can we be better have a customer journey? What needs to change? And they have a massive system, you know, which you, the regular consumer just doesn't understand when it goes through. You've got digital point of sale, you've got um, wraparounds for newspapers, all these media things, but then also having their own platforms to change and making sure they work with things like, um, uh, mobile payments and that sort of stuff. So it was a massive undertaking that we had to do. But it was something that was really core to their future success. And they're doing really well. They weren't doing badly before, but they're doing really well now. It's like starting to really be innovative and move things forward. So really had a lot of fun um, with them and um, still friends today. So it's a good, it was a good one to sort of start with. But yeah, that's, that's a good example of a client. Some people mm -hmm. just want me to go in and look at their digital strategy and say, it's great or it's not great. How do, how do we fix it? Other people have no strategy and they, uh, they want to get one, um, which is kind of the best way of having it. If you don't have a, a real strategy, but you kind of want to create something to move forward with, that's a great way of, um, uh, sort of getting a new client. Whereas most people come with a bit of baggage, which is totally acceptable these days. You know, sure. Most companies aren't new. Um, I get to work with a big range. So some are agencies where they'll bring me in for a pitch um, and where, you know, I can act as a pitch doctor um, or we can come up with a strategy together. So I work with specialist firms um, in that sort of sense um, to help people with um, big campaigns or little campaigns. Um, and uh, my, one of my favorite things to do with clients is when they want to create new products and revenue streams because that's a much larger project that you can get your teeth into, which is mm. obviously, you know, where you get some of these emerging technologies and go, how can you use 3D printing? Is that something you want to think about? You know, so it's a really interesting um, uh, time to be in sort of the position of that Hereforth affords me because there's so many technologies that are coming through which are now accessible, whereas, you know, five, maybe 10 years ago, either they weren't around or they were just cost prohibitive, whereas now you can actually do some things with them. This week's episode is brought to you by the fantastic folks at Kiva. The news can be pretty overwhelming these days, and it's hard to know when to act. But Kiva proves that when each of us takes small actions, our collective efforts can transform the world for millions of people. Kiva.org is the world's largest crowdfunding platform for social good. With Kiva, you can back the dreams of refugees, small business owners, students, and those needing a chance at home in the U.S. and abroad. The best part is that it's a loan, not a donation, so as you get repaid, you can continue to recycle your money to fund more individuals. You may have heard the phrase, if you teach a man to fish, 
you can feed them for a lifetime. Kiva's borrowers already know how to fish. They just need a little money to buy a net. And in small $25 increments, Kiva's growing global community of 1.6 million lenders have crowdfunded $1 billion with a 97% repayment rate. That's proof of a compelling mission and sustainable model. All right, so listen up. Join in the movement today at kiva.org slash SPP. That's K-I-V-A dot org slash SPP. And if you make your first loan during July or August, Kiva will give you a $25 credit to back a second dream. That's kiva.org slash SPP to get started. And now back to the episode. Right. Okay. Now this is all coming together. So you know, because I was thinking, okay, it sounds like what you were starting was a uh, digital strategy consultancy, right? And I know you yeah. don't you don't like the word consultant, so but that's just mm-hmm. kind of top of mind, especially being in DC. Everyone's a consultant, but you brand yourself more as the emerging technologies and how to apply them, and that's of course what your book is about. And the book is disruptive technologies, and I want to talk about that, but. Was that because you realized that although we can look at what you're currently doing from a digital perspective, where we need to be focused is on what to do in the future to make sure your digital strategy is uh, up to par? Yeah, I think um, it's always important to sort of uh, focus on what's happening now, because that's obviously your realistic element, you know, keeping the nine to five running. But it's always good to have an eye on the future. And that's, that was a big part of why I wanted to write the book. But working with um, clients from uh, Coca-Cola to Rand Rover to Unilever, you know, to smaller clients that we've worked with, um, one, one thing uh, connects them all is they are always hungry to know what's coming for their lunch because they know that everyone's coming for their lunch, whether they're big or small, someone's going to come for them or disruption is just going to come for them. And so that was a big driver of um, why I wanted to write the book really. But um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a really eclectic mix of clients, but the one thing that ties it all through is advice. And that's why I don't call myself a consultant. I call myself an advisor. Mm-hmm. For I, I'm not tied to putting money in Facebook's pocket or pushing a specific framework. I have a framework I use, which is obviously in the book, but mm-hmm. um, it's not something I'm wedded to if they want to use a new one or we want to create one ourselves. That's always um, sort of fully there, if that makes sense. No, it does. So let's talk about, let's get into this idea of emerging technologies. And, and as I just mentioned, your book, Disruptive Technology, understand, evaluate, respond, brand new book. Um, First, I want to start here. When we talk about emerging technologies, how do you define them? So I always say an emerging technology is something that you might have some sort of awareness of now, but ultimately it's not fully there. So for an example, 3D printing is an emerging technology. We don't simply know where it's going to end, whereas at the moment there's a lot of people talking about 4D um, 4D printing technology and that sort of stuff. It's not fully baked. So those are the ones that are emerging. When penetration usually comes above 50%, that's when I usually say it's normally there. Some people disagree and they say it's before that. But really for me, it's about 50% of the people. If you could ask 50 percent of 10 people and they would all know what you're talking about then you know pretty much something's arrived so that that's usually the definition but there are you know use the internet there's loads of um, people that would disagree and there's more technical ones but that's the way i use it i, keep, I try to keep things most simply yeah no and i just want to make sure we're starting off on the same page so when you're focusing on them and specifically you're talking about how businesses need to utilize them because as you mentioned you know everybody's always out to get them I've run a couple of businesses, start a couple of small ones and help start ones and everything. It's hard to get a business up and running. It's even harder to keep it running. And that's just on executing on your core business. How do you advise companies to keep up to date on all of these new things while still doing the hard stuff, which is running the business? Yeah, it's like how do you keep how do you do anything extra other than the nine to five right. these days without staying nine till seven and that sort of stuff, yeah. which is a great question and I love to answer it. For me, I've always said to somebody, and this we worked like dogs when we were out in LA. You know, you were young, you were like trying to get ahead and all of that sort of stuff. You would work like 12, 14, 15 hour days and that sort of stuff, mm-hmm. which I'm sure is still not uncommon out there. Yeah. But um over in Britain, the 
uh, it's sort of like a badge of honor to stay late or like be as stay as late as the boss and that sort of stuff or just be the last one out the door. And that that culture has to stop because that's not really helping anyone. But to understand um, emerging technologies, you have got to get that time back from somewhere, right? Because we've only got 24 hours of the day. We're only going to live for roughly about 80 years and that sort of stuff. So that was one thing I really wanted to cover off in the book. I said, look, I can't literally give you an extra hour in the day, but I could probably scrape one back for or claw one back for you. So um, Laura van der Kamp has a great book out. You have more time than you think. 178 hours, you have more time than you think. I say to anyone who's listened to this, get that book. It's an amazing book. Um, and I was very clear in there about how to um, score back an hour, either a week or a day, which is very easy to do, actually. It seems a lot harder than it is um, through either rescheduling, not scheduling, um, or lots of other uh, tips that are given in the book. And using that time, you can either bank it so that you don't you do something else at that time or you can think about new uh, strategies and that sort of stuff. But that was the sort of like core focus of the first part of the book, which is really sort of understanding, A, all of the technologies involved, but B, the mammoth task you have if you want to change anything in a business these days. Because it's not easy. It's not a box. You can go to an agency and go, oh, hi, we'd like 3D printing. Can we have, can we have three days of that? It mm -hmm. just doesn't exist. So there's something to be said for understanding those technologies yourself so that you ask smarter questions of your partners and agencies. And that's, that's why that first part of the book exists. Mm. Yeah. And, and in that first part, there's some really interesting just call outs of emerging technology. And I, I wanted to basically bring some of those up and, and get your reaction. The first, which I think is really, well, not, I think is seeing the limelight is blockchain. And, you know, whether we're talking Bitcoin or another one, so I'd love to hear kind of your thoughts on it and where you think it's going and how com you're seeing companies either utilize it or potentially utilizing it going forward. Sure. Blockchain is one of the technologies in the book. There's five in total. Um, but I often refer to it as the least sexy and the most dangerous hmm. because it's um, a foundational technology, which sounds more lofty than it is. It's literally saying this technology can have other things built on top of it. So while it might might be hard to understand or very um, difficult to get involved in, um, the potential for healthcare, uh, luxury goods, identity, governments, and that sort of stuff cannot be understated with blockchain. I don't think, and I'm still think, I still think I'm correct in saying that it hasn't been hacked yet, um, and is very unlikely to be hacked. Most people think of blockchain as Bitcoin and virtual currencies and mm -hmm. that sort of stuff, and it's much, much more than that. It is a more secure method of um, transmitting trust. That's the way I sort of like describe it. To say, you know. Hi, Mr. Uh, person in Russia. Let's talk to this person in England. And England can then talk to somebody in um, China. And because there's no way that that um, information can be hacked or um, changed because it's in a public ledger, you know that what's happened happened, if that makes sense. So the potential for news or ad fraud and that sort of stuff where the people are having real issues with like, oh, God, who do I trust? What do I do? You know, have I seen this? Was it on this site? Um, blockchain has a real opportunity to really swoop in and really disrupt a lot of people's way that they make money. And how are companies looking at them? Or do you, do you have you cons uh, worked with any that are trying to implement it in different ways? I'm just trying to, because again, I don't fully understand it, but I'm trying to see how you might be working with someone and then recommend that they look at the potential of blockchain. Sure. So that, that is exactly how we work with, um, I, I can say a financial institution at the moment, and I can say a uh, clothing company, mm. which may sound a bit weird, but it's about um, distribution and knowing where things are along the supply chain. And that's about as much as I can say without mm -hmm. giving away who it is. But um, yeah, the bank, for example, or financial institution, we should say, it might be a bank, who knows, might be not. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is... Um, really for them exploring how it can go beyond currency and how it can help them understand different parts of their value chain and how their consumers, because don't forget, banking is one of those things where trust has been fundamentally rocked by massive crises, or you've got um, issues that have happened in a home uh, city or town and that sort of stuff. Banks are closing, so you're like, oh, what am I trusting? Trust is being eroded. And also you've got lots of people coming for their lunch, whether that's people like Stripe, or you've got um, Apple Pay and that sort of stuff. You've got a lot of people who can now effectively, Quote, unquote, be banks. So you start to get a bit of a, a tectonic sort of shifting happen. And that's when something like blockchain can really help add a lot more trust to a banking um, perspective. Um, 
so yeah so we were going for a couple of or we've gone in rather for a couple of areas so number one was just pure thought leadership innovation how can you think about these areas and uh really show the world that you're taking this seriously and we talked about the investment that they would do in that sort of area and then the other one um we really looked at how they can implement from a very practical level and who they should work with so we did a competitive audit on different companies that were offering um blockchain as a sort of SaaS um, help model, if that makes sense. Let's let's specifically, just because I'd like to get your thoughts on where do you think it's going? And specifically, let's bring it down to the one that everybody does know about, which is this virtual currency. Like, How do you feel about that as an emerging technology, especially with, I mean, I don't know if people have been tracking, but just the, the surge in the value of Bitcoin? Sure. So news and sort of uh, investigations into why it's starting to surge was came down to one really major thing that sort of happened. And that was that Bitcoin became legal tender, quote unquote, in China um, and Asia and those, um, a, couple of, a couple of major markets. And that's really what caused the sort of blip um, that was going. It was always going up. Obviously, it's a volatile market and I'm not an investment banker. I can't tell anyone mm-hmm. what to do financially and I would not progress to. But um, uh, Bitcoin is one of those really interesting uh, technologies and areas where there's a lot of thought leadership going on at the moment. But it's kind of if you've got enough money to play with it, then it's probably a good thing to do. You and I or you know, listeners out there who might not have the billions and millions um, of investment money might want to stay away from it at the moment. You've got a long time to worry about getting the last 20% of Bitcoin because right. of the way that the um, system set up. So you've actually got about 104 years before all of it's going to, the rest of it's going to be mined because mm. of the way the algorithm um, decreases by four times uh, every time a new block is, uh, sorry, a new bit is released. So you've got a lot of time to get that, get the rest of it. And that's the issue with the, um, the ecosystem at the moment is that it's not well understood and that people think it's in for a quick buck but and you're seeing things like bitcoin atms pop up and that sort of stuff in, in big cities but you still can't go in to uh to give you an example over here starbucks or over there rather and pay with bitcoin right. it just doesn't exist unless you've got some form of other element that you can uh utilize some other system um so it's not like starbucks is going to suddenly go right we accept bitcoin or anything like that it's it's one of those works in progress but a really interesting technology and the foundation of it blockchain is much much more interesting than any currency that i personally speaking than any currency i see out there at the moment sure yeah i know it was kind of the um wasn't bitcoin kind of the beginning ideas of blockchain and then from there it's just kind of continued to evolve and grow and expand well blockchain was the foundation of bitcoin so there is no sort of blockchain without bitcoin if that was but it's really become yeah. a brand you know that's why most people get it mixed up at the moment mm-hmm. but a lot of people are starting to figure out now that there is a massive delineation between currency and everything else that blockchain can do mm-hmm. so i think that's the that's the interesting part of that technology virtual currency yes someone somewhere is getting rich or that sort of stuff and it's great to be able to track transactions but it's not exactly new new if that makes sense Mm. whereas some form of um new copyright could be derived from um, blockchain which is a massive issue if you've got something like luxury goods or um art that's going online you know that could be a massive revenue stream that completely upend the way that um, the internet monetizes things for artists or anything else like that so the potential for that sort of technology is absolutely huge hence why it's in the book called disruptive technologies because it could really disrupt a lot of industries quite quickly which one of the emerging technologies that you highlight are you most excited about uh but it's between two i would say blockchain and artificial intelligence not that they're all not worthy Mm -hmm. otherwise they wouldn't be in the book right but i think uh the immediate potential for blockchain to rebalance certain things that are out of whack and definitely volatile has a massive massive potential to do that and certainly build upon it like i keep saying foundational is the way that i would describe anything to do with blockchain because what you can build on top of that technology is somewhat endless you know artificial intelligence is a massive spectrum at the moment and a massive bugbear of mine because people keep saying the word artificial intelligence when they mean a subset of it, which is machine learning. So yes, it's great that a computer can be a grand chess master, but it can't uh, denote your emotions and serve you a different meal because of it. But they're definitely trying hard, and that's certainly something that all the companies sort of want to do. Artificial intelligence in its rawest form is a computer literally mimicking a human's intelligence and possibly even 
uh, superseding a human's intelligence. And that's when the issues start to really arise. I like artificial intelligence because it is ethically, uh, it's an ethical quandary that a lot of people struggle with. And I, I personally find it fascinating, but it's not everyone's cup of tea. Mm-hmm. But um, I really do get a kick out of listening to um, scientists talk about it, mixed with ethicists, and also consumers. You know, consumers just don't have enough information in a pure form that's really useful to them. Often it's um, hyped up or uh, whipped up with some sort of frenzy about it. And it's not really given in the right sort of way to see a massive potential for it. I love all the technology that I talk about in the book, but those two are the real ones that I, I see really changing our world in both good and in, in good and bad ways. If you've ever found yourself daydreaming during the workday or spending countless hours on small tasks, try NutroBoost. NutroBoost is a top-rated supplement made from nootropics, cognitive enhancing compounds that when stacked in the right combination, give some of Silicon Valley's best coders and business people their extra edge. They are 100% safe and in this case, made from natural and potent cognitive enhancers that will significantly improve your focus, concentration, and memory. So, for all you hustlers, strivers, and thrivers, anyone looking to get the most out of their lives, count on NutroBoost to increase your productivity and give you the competitive edge needed to conquer any challenge. That way, you can have more time in the day to enjoy the important things in life. For a limited time, NutriBoost is offering a free 30-day supply. That's a $60 value, and all you'll have to pay is less than $5 for shipping. Head over to trynutroboost.com slash smart. That's T-R-Y-N-O-O-T-R-O-B-O-O-S-T dot com slash smart to claim your free trial now while supplies last and before this offer expires. Again, that's trynutroboost.com slash smart, T-R-Y-N-O-O-T-R-O-B-O-O-S-T dot com slash smart. And now back to the episode. Oh, yeah. I mean, AI, I think, uh, has been documented as just being, it could be the end all be all, you know, and we actually had somebody, a uh, guest on the show who thought that essentially uh, computers will be the next evolution of the top of the food chain and therefore render us useless, which is uh, kind of scary. But so what were the other ones? You have nanotechnology, I know. What were the other uh, two that you talked about in the book? Uh, 3D printing and holography are the other ones. There you go. Holography, study of holograms, but you've also got things like augmented reality, virtual reality. I mentioned those. They aren't super disruptive. They don't fit the um, equation for that, but they are of interest, and I definitely love those technologies, and I do see a lot of value coming from them. But holography in its purest form, which is literally, imagine in Star Wars, R2-D2 beaming out Princess Leia, and you've got exactly what holography should be. The Mm -hmm. physics just isn't there to support it, but it doesn't mean they won't be there in like 10 or 15 years. That's what we're, that's what the experts that I I spoke to are are very sort of like bullish on they say it's coming we're just working on it now there's lots of ways that we can sort of fake it at the moment but what we really want is that smartphone that will you know show you the sneaker from adidas on your phone and you just click to buy you know so they're 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 pushing for it hard so i wouldn't i wouldn't uh, not bet against it if that makes sense sure so we have these five and these are the ones again just outlined in the book and what i'm curious about first is tell me about the framework that you have the tbd framework which will and, and what it is and how it's helpful to essentially to your clients. I mean, why you came up with it. I came up with it uh, over a decade ago and I've, I've refined it ever since. Um, but we were literally on the balcony having drinks at a weird sort of networking LA party as you sort of do when you're out there. And um, it was, I was just having sort of one of those moments where you look down and you just see a city and things are moving or you see a plane going across and you just realize it's a system and it's all working and you're trying to like figure out different bits or you might see one thing that leads to another and that sort of stuff. And that I was just in that frame of mind at the time. And then I had a chat with, um, Um, a guy who turned out to be a William Morris agent and we were laughing and joking about um, the Hollywood model and how it's changing and changed and all of that sort of stuff. And we really basically um, thought about uh, the different elements of it and, and he said something quite crass and sort of off the cuff and um, I said look it's about three elements technology behavior and data and it literally just hit me like a moment there I was like that's something that a I'm going to remember and b I think other people would 
would find easy to think about. And um, scrolled it on a napkin and um, literally would c- continued chatting to him. But I, in the back of my head, I was always thinking about how, how could that works. That works. Oh, that's quite interesting and that sort of stuff. And so that that was the lightning moment. And then I went home um, and we sort of uh, I sat sat down. I was thinking about it, and it was one of those things that you know you were sort of like, there's something there, but. I just want to go to bed right now. So went to bed, um, got up the next morning, found the napkin, and I started just writing loads of stuff down and started to draw and, uh, you know, sketch it out and that sort of stuff. And it, it sort of came together. So at its simplest, it is – there's two versions in the book. One is TBD and the other one is called TBD+. Plus. TBD, uh, the simple version as I call it, uh, is in order to make a decision, to make a decision, to make a decision, basically. So that's what it is. And it stands for Technology, Behavior, and Data, as we said. And there's three questions that you ask in the simple version. So for T, it's can they, like can they do what you want them to do? Uh, For B, behavior, it's will they do what they want them to do? So they can be society, the company, uh, new client cluster or whatever you want. Uh, And then the D D bit is will enough of them do it? So technology, behavior and data, can they do it? Will they do it? Will enough do it? Is literally the only three questions that you ask. And what you do is you assign a score of 10 to each of those uh, questions and you answer it as if it's sort of... uh, has has a finite question so it's, it's kind of a it's a it's a check mark it's not a rigid science if that makes sense mm-hmm. so um to give you an example of t for example so there's a question that you answer from naught to 10 so zero a score of zero would mean they've got no chance of doing what you want them to do they're never going to be able to do it and 10 means everyone's already doing it okay so that's mm-hmm. your spectrum no one's doing it everyone's already doing it so you can give them an example of uh what should we say Augmented reality um, filters on Snapchat uh, allow, should we use one for our new, um, which we have, our new smartphone that we're launching, all right? So should we create one? So technology for that uh, would probably be a, a solid five to seven depending on who your audience is. Obviously, you've got to know that. Um, the behavior, how many people are doing it, a few, but probably not all of them. So you'd probably give that a three. Um, and then the data, how many of them do you need to do that in order to be a success? You can give that any score that you like. So you start adding that up and you get a final score. And then the biggest thing in the book sort of decides um, uh, how to sort of use what we call a decision matrix at that sort of stage, which is literally a list of things that you're going to do if you get a certain score. So if you get a score of 30, which is the highest score you can get, it means you should, oh my God, you should already be doing it. How much budget do you assign for it? What's the process and how do you get going? Mm. And that's the 30. And if it's like zero to 10, you can have one decision to probably not worry about it or reevaluate in six months. Um, and all the others can have them. I know clients that have one for every single number from 0 to 30. I know clients that have, you know, above 15 will do something, below 15 they do nothing. So it's really down to um, the person that's using it and the company they work for, and that's the that's the focus of the book. The book works for anyone, whether you're in a company that's incredibly gung-ho about innovation or not. Um, and that's, that's TBD. And then literally you've made that decision and you start working towards it. So TBD plus is a bit more complex. That one um, uses what we call the TBD compass and um, it has six axes on it. So there's two elements um, of it. One is the organization and the other one is the consumer. And each of those are given a score of 10 again. So you've got TBD for the organization and TBD for the um, consumer. And in in a very short way, you pick uh, six um, types of people uh, throughout your business, whether you've got them or not, you can substitute. And I give you loads of different job titles, but giving you um, a couple of examples. So for the tech consumer side, you might use someone like a head of brand, head of marketing, um, sales person, comms person. Um, And for the behavior of the consumer, you might use a head of customer service. Uh, And then for the data, you might use um, someone like a chief chief innovation officer, maybe a consultant or someone like that. And then you go through the same again and you do technology for the organization, which could be uh, chief technology officer or uh, IT manager. A a behavior organization element of it could also be um, the CEO or the MD. And then for the data organization, it might be the CFO. So 
in a nutshell, you get a really good group of people with very different perspectives that are all part of the same business or, you know, they've been drafted in to be a part of that business. Uh, and they have literally one question to answer. And then they go away and they research that and they give people loads of um, free options and paid options in the um, book to really understand um, and figure out uh, how to answer that question and make sure they've got the right research and the right data. And then they, they get to make a decision between naught and 10. And you get, again, those scales that are really sort of useful. So uh, I'm just trying to remember off the top of my head what the question is that you answer for um, uh, the T part of it. Let's do, um, I always remember this one, the technology and the company side, uh, sorry, consumer. So the question that they have to ask is um, how much of the market already has the technology? And so the scale from 0 to 10 there is technology doesn't exist is zero. And then everyone is already using it is, again, the 10. So your head of brand, head of marketing, sales and comms goes away, researches the devil out of the idea that you've got um, in the industry. So 3D printing for teenagers um, between the ages of 16 and 19. Uh, are any of them using it? What percentage? Where are they? What machines are they? They you do all of that. And then they answer that one question. They come back and they do a mini presentation and say why they gave it a six or why they gave it a five. And then as a group, you decide what those numbers are. And so again, six elements, you've got a maximum of 60. What's coming next? You have to do a decision, mat uh, an investment matrix this time. So it's not you've made the decision. Now you've got the investment matrix and you can plot them out on um, the compass that we do. And so you start to see shapes that can come in, whether it's a fox, an iceberg, a reverse iceberg. There's lots of ones that are explained in the book. And uh, based on that, you can decide what level of investment that you do. And again, because you've got that matrix, you decide, you've already decided what the decisions are and you agreed them as a group. So you can literally just go ahead and start implementing. And that's the biggest part of the book is that it really enables people to make a real change in their business because it gives you the time to do it. And also it helps you pre-agree with the higher ups who often control the purse strings, what you're going to do when. And that's a very rough way, a very quick way of going through those sort of two. But the book obviously is a step-by-step -step guide and how to do it. Sure. And so basically, would you consider it a, it's, it's a tool to create action in an uncertain environment? I love that phrase and I will be stealing that from you. <laughs> yes, no, it's exactly that. It's a really concise, practical guide to um, progressing in some sort of way or other to, towards an innovation goal. Right. Considering so much of this and, you know, it is where I was going to say is considering so much of this is unknown because you talk about forecasting a little bit and yep. it seems really difficult. I mean, for any time I've been in a role where we've been trying to innovate or, um, you know, take advantage of whether it be technologies or just pivot to some extent. It's that unknown where you know you have to go, but you know it's probably going to take more effort, money, time than you thought, and you don't even know the outcome. So you can get stuck in that, um, you know, inability to proceed. And it sounds like in this way, you're doing as much as you can up front and then giving it a shot. Yeah. And I mean, the, the, the thing that I really have learned a lot throughout my career is if you um, tell someone what you're doing up front, you're less likely to get a negative reaction at the end. And so I think that theory is called either dentist chair or something like that. Or there's an example about the dentist and that sort of stuff. But um, when I talked to a client, I said, look, this process might be a bit hard. It might be rough. Let's talk about that now. How are you going to feel? What should I say if uh, and that sort of stuff. I'm like, do you want to have a safe word? You know, it, it can be really quite a sort of comical thing to say to a client, like, what's a safe word? Like when you're feeling uncomfortable that something's got to change. As long as you've got that like trust between you two, that should be totally fine. But it's a different story when I leave that building mm -hmm. and they've got to talk to the person that they want money from. So again, the book coaches people through how to sell it into higher ups and how to really sort of start to get people on board. You know, it's not, there are a certain amount of people in the world that are natural cheerleaders and communicators. Most people aren't. They have to sort of like corral a group around them how do you do that the book sort of goes through a little bit more about that but yeah the the basic premise behind the book was literally to say if you tell someone what you're going to do you can't get mad with them afterwards for them not doing it so again it was that sort of like okay let's just have an adult conversation and talk about this thing that we need to do otherwise in two or three years we're going to be forced to do it and it'll be a lot rougher so why not let's see if we can head this off right now or even find some new areas that other people aren't seeing and that's what i think the book really helps a lot of people do and what i've helped people do um, throughout my career how do you think this is relatable to either the average person or even the, the, the smaller entrepreneur? I mean, 
because when I look at it, I can see how it makes sense for these large companies, you know, these big banks or um, whoever it might be, you know, these multi-billion dollar companies. But for the startups and even the unfunded startups, you know, the solopreneurs, um, how do they utilize either this structure and or this mindset to keep pace or be successful? So I wrote the book in mind with no one in particular. I think CEOs, CTO, CMO, all the C-suite can get a lot out of it because obviously they'll recognize their departments and see themselves in it. But I think the entrepreneurs um, can get a lot from time management at the front, but also just having a structure around innovation. Because don't forget, when you're on your own, you are on your own. You've got literally 24 hours the same as everyone else. You've built your network up, and now it's time to sort of figure out who are your CTO but is, that you don't pay for it. A lot of entrepreneurs that I I've worked with and um, talked to tell me that like I have a virtual network around my business as well. So yes, while it's me, you know, hustling away and that sort of stuff, actually, I do rely on these people for these sorts of business services, quote unquote, and sort of how they feed me. That's a constant phrase I get at the moment, feed me, how, how I'm fed with information, which is quite an interesting sort of way yeah. to think about um, getting information, I always say. But um, yeah, it, I think entrepreneurs get a lot out of the book because it gives them a process. And sometimes when you're on your own, it's quite frantic and frenetic and you bounce from one thing to another so it's a good sort of uh, you know way of working um but yeah again big businesses can get a lot out of it and medium you know to small businesses also can um, really use the process if you don't have a process you can't manage something so i think that's the that's the key to this sort of um problem sure yeah well paul it's really fascinating i appreciate all of the insight uh again your book is disruptive technologies understand evaluate respond I know you're also writing for other places out there. You're kind of all, you know, do, you're doing a lot. So let our listeners know kind of where they can follow you, read up on you, learn from you if they're into this kind of emerging tech and, and things like that. And also if you have other resources for those interested in this. Sure. So um, I'm lucky enough to contribute to Forbes. I talk about emerging technologies, change, innovation, interesting tech, startups, that sort of stuff. So if you've got one, feel free to pitch me. I'd love to hear from you. I also get to write for Reuters, which is more to do about the news industry and how that's changing and media and everything like that. And Cool Hunting, which is another one. So if I see something that I consider cool, I get to pitch it to the guys over there and I write about that sort of stuff. Um, there is two really interesting things that I think would really resonate with your listeners as well, the listeners. So the first one is a weekly newsletter called Concentrate, which which has about 16,000 subscribers at the moment and covers everything from emerging tech, media, all the way through to uh, different ways to think, work, how to claw back time. It's like a really useful um, uh, one-stop shop. Comes out seven o'clock uh, every Sunday. Uh, and I thoroughly recommend it. It's a, it's a really useful um news that I get a lot from uh, putting it together so hopefully the readers do um, and then we created a product recently called Social Lens which is um, a paid for Slack community and it was one of the first in the UK and so for 50 quid a month or $50 you um, join a group of people so it includes people from Snap, Mindshare, HSBC, Santander, Digiday, loads of people that have like signed up for it and they get um, what happens in social technologies and platforms when news breaks and also the more important part the analysis so why is it happening and what do you do because of it and then every week you get a weekly wrap of everything that's gone on in the social sphere yeah. uh, so again you save a lot of time by using a curation tool like that and you don't have to necessarily be checking TechCrunch every 15 seconds to see if something's changed or wait for the news to hit you you get it sent directly to your phone and so that's a that's a tool that we're pushing hard at the moment yeah no that's sound, those sound great where can we find those because I just really quick tried to google the first one and I I mean, I'm not putting a lot of effort into that, but I'm wondering <laughs> yeah, if you yeah, can make it so easier for us. Where where do we go for each of those? Sure. So um, two two websites to go to if you want anything about me is hereforth, H-E-R-E-F-O-R-T-H.com mm -hmm. uh, or paularmstrong.net, paularmstrong.net. And you can get email to me on both of those or Twitter, Paul double underscore Armstrong and drop me a line. Love to hear from anyone who's got amazing startups um, doing something um, cool, unique, innovative. Hit me up. OK, great. Yeah. And I see at hereforth.com under newsletters. That's where the concentrate one is. Yeah. Great. Well, Paul, thank you again so much for your time. It's been a blast. Uh, good luck with this and congrats on the release of the new book. Brilliant. Thanks ever so much for having me. Appreciate it. Cool. All right. Have a good one. No worries. Speak soon. All righty. Bye-bye. Welcome back. 
Hope you enjoyed that interview with Paul Armstrong. Paul's book, Disruptive Technologies, Understand, Evaluate, Respond, is available at your local bookstore and on Amazon. And if you purchase the book through Amazon, please do not forget to use the Smart People Podcast Amazon link located at smartpeoplepodcast.com slash Amazon. As always, that comes to no extra cost to you and gives this show a nice little kickback. And if you're looking for other free and easy ways to support the show, head over to iTunes or Apple Podcasts, whatever they're calling it today, and leave us a review and rating. We'd greatly appreciate that. If you want to get in touch with the show, you can shoot us an email at smartpeoplepodcast at gmail.com, or you can send us a message on Twitter at smartpeoplepod. Well, the summer is winding down and this year is absolutely flying by, but we've got some great interviews coming up. So make sure you stay tuned to all things Smart People Podcast. Head over to the website, smartpeoplepodcast.com, sign up for the newsletter, and we will see you all next episode. Today's episode was brought to you by Kiva. You may have heard the phrase, if you teach a man to fish, you can feed him for a lifetime. But what if I told you there are millions of people who already know how to fish? They just need a net. Kiva.org is the world's largest crowdfunding platform for social good. 1.6 million lenders have backed $1 billion in dreams of refugees, small business owners, and those who need a chance, proving that small acts make a huge difference. Join in the movement today at kiva.org slash SPP. That's K-I-V-A dot org slash SPP. Mm-hmm.